February 26, 2022. Um, Jackie, could we please take a roll? Michael Baker. Here. Jesse Bank. Doesn't look like he's here yet. Todd Byrother. Here. Greg Francis. Here. Carol Shook. Doesn't look like she's here yet either. Tim Williams. Here. Uh, Cliff Winger is not here yet. Mary Winkus. Hello. And uh, thank you. Council yes. Member Kinnear. Here. Okay, so we don't quite have a quorum yet. We're at four? Yeah. Okay. Which raises a point. We, we it has before. Voting commissioners is delays us obviously don't count, right? So, I'm right. Not. Welcome, but <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, then uh, we can jump into some things. Let's uh, open to public comment if anyone from the public would like to comment on something not on the agenda. Um, we welcome you. Hey, Lewis, this is Paul Crop. Congratulations, it has been a long ride. Uh, they always say that folks like you take with them institutional memory, which of course you do. But um, my observation is that that memory has been a real stabilizer uh, in, in on many occasions. So thank you for that. Thank you for your service. Glad to know you've got a friendly cat as well. Take care. Thank you, sir. I'm not leaving the Spokane area and I know the city has my number, so um, I'm not expecting uh, daily calls or hopefully not even weekly, but if something major comes up, I'm open to uh, trying to remember what I now, know now in the future anyway. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul. That was appropriate to, to have you voice in there. Anyone else from the public? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I don't see any, any other commissioners joining us here. So let's uh, in, in the briefing moving in the briefing session. Let's skip over the minutes for now and and um, ask for a city council report. Council member Kinnear, please. Thank you. So um, most importantly, uh, Mary Winkus and I last night testified before the legislature on a bill for the um, Senate, was it Senate or House? No, like, oh no, it was the House uh, uh, Transportation Committee on speeds and traffic cameras around parks and hospitals. So I testified last week before the Senate Transportation Committee and this one was before the House. It was impactful because if this is passed, it will mean that we can get more secure areas around our hospitals and around our parks where we have vulnerable citizens and children. Right now, we do not have a traffic unit in the city. So all those officers will transfer to patrol. And that makes it even more important that we have some kind of enforcement mechanism around those areas. So fingers crossed that this will pass through committee and will go on to the full legislature for approval. Council also approved 1.5 $1.45 million for the Don Cardone Bridge replacement. As you know, that's just about ready to fall into the river. And that will start work immediately. It's shovel ready. Those funds were ARPA funds, so American Rescue Plan funds. And that was our first big installment of allocating those funds for this project. There's also um, 800,000 in um, grants that are gonna go towards this project. And then council also approved the mayor's appointments for HR director and most importantly for all of you and all of us a planning director. So we're really excited about that. And then I just want to add my bit while I've got the floor on uh, Lewis Mueller because I've worked at the city since 2008. So Lewis was there and he was always the go-to guy. Help me, help me. And Lewis was always that um, person who was very calm, cool, collected with this amazing sense of humor and very dry sense of humor. 
and you never knew what he was going to say. So you were kind of always on edge, like, uh oh, what's he going to do? And we're going to miss that. Uh, he, Paul Krupp's right. He's taking a lot of institutional knowledge out the door. I'd like to think that some of that knowledge got implanted in my brain um, as a planner wannabe and as a planning geek. I am hopeful that I can give you a call and say, Lewis, help me, help me again, because you're not leaving Spokane and we have your number. So thank you for your years of service. We really appreciate it. And we're going to miss you terribly. Any questions? Okay, thank, thank you. Um, community assembly report, Mary, please. Uh, well, all I can do is say is add a thank you uh, to everybody else's about the help Lewis has given us, and uh, I appreciate everything he's done. And don't change your number when you leave because we probably will need it. Um, and uh, I keep my fingers off it. Um, I I did uh, I had fun uh, doing the the uh, testimony in front of the legislature last yeah, last legislative committee last night, and I hope I hope it helped, and uh, so we can get some stability in in the parks and 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 hospitals. Uh, the speeding is just really out of control. So I hope I hope it's a bill that Marcus uh, Richelli and Tim Ormsby are sponsoring. So hope it goes through, and I'll do whatever I can in the Senate if I need to. So anyway, that's that's what I've got. All right, thank you, Mary. Okay, uh, President Report. Yes, if it's not obvious, this is meant to be a Lewis Love Fest today. So um, I also want to thank you. Um, I met Lewis as a friend of a friend, and and. In, in the planning and design realm. So um, it's been great to work alongside of you on, on the commission. Um, I wanna thank uh, Lewis's colleagues uh, for helping us to um, prepare a proclamation today. And I'm gonna ask our vice president, uh, Greg Francis to, to please read it. Sure. Here it is, Lewis, right here. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a proclamation recognizing Lewis Mueller's many significant contributions to the city of Spokane throughout his 25 year career with the city planning department and his work with the planning commission while planning for Spokane's future. Whereas Lewis has been an invaluable employee to the city of Spokane since 1994, when he accepted a position with the planning department. And whereas Lewis has worked tirelessly over the years to develop plans, programs, goals, policies, regulations, resolutions, ordinances, development permits, staff reports, feasibility studies, newsletter articles, press releases, surveys, notices, interviews, presentations, SEPA analyses, land use analyses, and any and all other kinds of analyses imaginable and Whereas Lewis's work on major projects, including the city's adoption of the Growth Management Act, the housing chapter, the comprehensive plan land use chapter, and implementing unified development code regulations, urban growth area planning and regional planning, fast forward Spokane downtown plan, joint use land use planning with the Fairchild Air Force Base. Wow, there's a lot of stuff here, Lewis. Um, Joint use planning with Fairchild Air Force Base, Link Spokane, and capital facilities planning, and numerous other projects represents a substantial body of extraordinary work that leaves a positive and permanent legacy for the citizens of Spokane. And whereas Lewis has worked enthusiastically and patiently with city staff, citizens, agency, and organizational representatives, Developers, boards, hearing examiners, focus groups, committees, councils, commissions, and members to solicit their ideas, listen to their concerns, help them understand planning ideas and planner speak, and give them his very wise and reasoned advice. And whereas Lewis is even keeled, polite, informed, collaborative, detailed, organized, efficient, hardworking, always willing to help others, and always willing to try to tell a joke. And whereas Lewis has, an extended, has attended an unimaginable number of meetings, juggled an unimaginable number of phone calls, listened to an 
unimaginable number of citizen and developer complaints, fixed an unimaginable number of problems, and heard an unimaginable number of staff opinions and worries, all while demonstrating humor and grace along the way. This does end eventually, okay, the same. And whereas, Lewis always demonstrated a keen ability to keep calm and cool during the eight administration transitions and reorganizations, nine changes in planning directors, twice served as an interim planning director, so that makes 11 planning directors, numerous turnovers in plan commission and city council members, political will changes, changes in planning ideas, staff changes, assignment changes, schedule changes, support changes, attitude changes, and always and forever, never ending annual budget cuts. And whereas members of the Planning Commission will sorely miss Lewis's leadership, knowledge and advice, but understand that there are joys to be had beyond working for the City of Spokane Planning Department, and that new opportunities and doors are sure to open for such a talented person. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Plan Commission proclaims its deep gratitude and thanks to Lewis Mueller for his many years of service to the Spokane community and wishes him well in his retirement. Outstanding. <laughs> wow, I was thank not you for that, right? Thank you very much for that. Uh, it is appreciated. I, I think that helps, uh, you know, explain all my gray hair that I have remaining anyway. So some of the gray hairs jump ship, um, but uh, it's still around somewhere. So. I'm really going to miss, like I, I've said, um, you know, working with you all, working with the public, plan commission, council members. Everybody has the best intentions uh, for the city over time. We've got to watch it change. I mean, we're in a very different place um, than we have been since the late 90s. And it's pretty impressive uh, when the community starts all pulling in the same direction, largely, what a community can do. So. I, I really appreciate that and I appreciate all your time too and devotion to uh, this effort. So anyway, and I, I hope uh, most of my jokes have gone over fairly well. Uh, a few people have uh, not gotten them for some reason. I don't understand that myself, um, but always know that I'm laughing at them no matter what. So, all right, I'll step aside. Thank you. Uh, that's outstanding, Lewis. And, you know, I, I think one thing I'd like to add is, um, you know, it's, it's, as we come in as commissioners and or you know, as with council members, you know, we're pretty temporary and uh, come in with with ideas. And, and, you know, somebody like, you know, Lewis with this very deliberate, cons consistent, actually long term plan, you know, that's it's significant to lose, you know, Lewis, you, you know, you, you were actually here at near, you know, the beginning of the comprehensive plan that we spend so much time on and to actually see out a 20 year vision is is pretty impressive so i that's that's what that that's what catches me is is someone saw 20 years and helped help implement a, a 20 year plan so thank you it has really been rewarding to to be a part of that and to get to see uh, the change over time and it's not easy you know for a a city of this size to change it's i've heard previous planning directors refer to trying to change the direction of an aircraft carrier I mean, it isn't sudden and you have to be deliberate about it in order to to make, you know, to set the community's path. So um, I am fortunate enough. I still get chirped at by previous directors and previous planning staff. And I hope to be 1 of those 2 that can be in the ear of, of the department a little bit, you know, periodically over time and be a part of that uh, kind of oversight. So, like I said, I'm, I'm not leaving my hometown. And so from time to time, you may. Hear me on the other side of the uh, microphone chirping about something myself. Thanks again. Oh, and, and there is an open position on the plan commission. So uh, please put your application in and, and we'll consider it. <laughs> <laughs> we got Joanne for a little while. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Um, okay, finishing our president report. Um, only thing I'd add is um, on the legislative side, uh, council president, Bags and I uh, were able to attend a, a stakeholder meeting on on a couple GMA bills last week with the local government chair from the House, uh, Representative Pollock. Um, and Council President Bags made a, a you know a great statement. It was really thought it was supportive of a lot of the work that that we do. Um, it was it was had some 
TOD themes, um, transfer development themes, and also had some some other input from the city on you know this question of local versus state, you know, um, kind of preemption on on GMA bills. So I want to thank him and the legislative committee for for that input. Um, let's see. Beyond that, um, I think um, we'll move on. Um, Council uh, or, or um, Commissioner Winger is is not here, but um, Mary for the Transportation Subcommittee Board. Did you want to say anything as Vice Chair? Uh, we will be meet. I I'm not prepared. I I will next time, but we will be meeting um, this coming with this coming week. Uh, and I I think I'm going to be heading the committee because Cliff has been working through some health issues. So yeah, and and we wish him. The best and the best recovery. So thank you, Mary. Yeah, so I and I did um I did rewrite um a draft of the uh, and we'll put it in front of first of the subcommittee and then bring it to the uh, uh, commission about uh, I need to leave my hands off the keyboard. Um, uh, that that there would be separate uh, council members, uh, one for the uh, subcommittee and one for uh, the plan commission. So uh, we'll take that up and then bring it next time to the uh, plan commission. Yeah, thank you. Just to reminder everyone that I think we established last meeting, it was the desire of for, of the council to name Correct. that. So you bring the rules in alignment with that. Okay. Yes. So I and I did a draft and we'll discuss it and I think it'll just go through, I suspect, and then on to the uh, plan commission for approval and then we're back in compliance with what is actually happening. So okay. thank you. It just, it, yeah, perfect. Um, I think we established that those were in the subcommittee rules and not in our plan commission rules. So that's okay. But since the, we are a subcommittee, I think I need to bring it before the Plan commission. So, don't we? Maybe I'm wrong there. Lewis, help! Don't before so you go. Then the commission, or, or not commission at all. Yeah, I, I believe we in the past it's been practice for this to be shared with the subcommittee itself, and everybody agree to it. And then I believe at that point it comes back to the commission. But I think the I have to look again. But I think the president can just accept them. Um, okay. In this case. Okay. Okay. So I'll just probably do it as a report then. But whatever, it's it's in process, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mary. Um, and by the way, if 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 everyone's not following, I think it's Councilmember Bingel, right? Who's been assigned? Yes. Okay. Okay, that's what I remember. Okay. Um, thank you, Secretary Porter. Um, I, I, we probably didn't mention this, but Terrell, you're actually serving as Secretary today, right? I'm going to be secretary today, so okay. Lewis can heckle was the decision. So, <laughs> okay. so yes, um, as has been mentioned, we have a new director starting on the 7th, that's Spencer Gardner, so the council has confirmed him. Um, and we have Lewis leaving February 4th, so lots been said about Lewis, but I too want to just thank him for being such a um, generous mentor and coworker and friend over the years, so. I will also miss Lewis very much. Um, and I also wanted to take uh, a, le a few minutes for, we have a new staff person, a new assistant planner, Casey Downey, who's um, I believe in the meeting. So if she is still in, if she could turn her camera on and, and say a quick hello to the commissioners, that'd be great. Good afternoon, commissioners. As was just said, my name is Casey Downey and I am joining the long range planning team. I am a somewhat recent transplant to Spokane. Before moving here, I was an associate planner with the city of Boise. So I have experience in design review, historic preservation, some general current planning, as well as neighborhood planning. Here in Spokane, I was previously working in project management for single family residential developments. And I am excited to work with all of you in planning the future of my new home. No matter how cheesy, I definitely know that sounds. And I am greatly appreciative of the warm welcomes I have received um, from any everyone at the city, including from Lewis. Um, so thank you, everyone. 
this day. I need to welcome you. Yeah. Welcome, Casey. Um, Casey, are you are you from Idaho originally? Yes, born, raised in Idaho, a um, few different places, but I was in Boise for about 10 years. Outstanding. Well, welcome to the community. And the only other thing I had to add to my report is that the next meeting, um, Jackie Churchill has again compiled our kind of year in review. So we have our 2021 year in review. Um, so that will be in your packet for the next meeting on the 9th. Um, so looks good. It's also nice to remember how much work we get done. So but that concludes my report. That's great. Jackie, are you going to present it to us next week or two weeks? I suppose I can, yes. <laughs> Unless Terrell would like to. It's pretty self-explanatory, but it is good to remember all the great work that gets done. That's good, so thank that'll you. That'll be in your packet. And I'm sure we will be continuing a development code discussion also. So back to you, Todd. Thank you. Um, when are the, are the development code, are they gonna come in, in multiple hearings or one big hearing and I think we're we're thinking the SEPA code uh, will likely be its own item. Um, we'll have to look for your guidance here as we continue through. It may be more manageable to have two hearings or one one okay. hearing that gets continued, sort of like comp plan amendments or such a big packet. So okay. um, we'll we'll bring more details of that at the next meeting. Okay, perfect. I guess that starts to roll into our workshop. But before we do that, I thank you, Terrell. Um, did we gain a commissioner and have quorum or are we still short? We don't, we're not taking any other action today. I so. believe Carol oh, Shook has joined. Um, she may be the call in person, so I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. if she can... Hi, Carol. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. So we do have quorum now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just, uh, go back to item 1. Um, can we hear a motion to approve the January 12th, 2022 meeting minutes, please. Move to approve. I second it. Okay, thank you. We'll go Greg and then Tim slash Carol. Um, any any edits? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, so approved. Thank you. Let's close the briefing session and then we'll hand it over to um, Nate and Amanda please, for the workshop. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, Commission President and Commissioners. Um, Nathan Gwynn with the city's planning department and joined on the call with uh, by Amanda Beck um, also with the city's planning department. And we're really pleased to welcome and introduce today Bob Bangford and, and Ian Crozier um, for some of you welcoming them back, uh, their consultant team at Makers. Uh, they've done some projects in Spokane in the past uh, with, with the planning, with the planning commission and planning staff and um, many other Washington jurisdictions. So uh, we've Amanda and I have been working closely with them over the past few weeks and uh, since your December workshop. And so um, we just uh, would, uh, really we're really excited to have them here today to continue uh, discussion on those topics. Anything to add Amanda before uh, Bob and Ian jump in? No, just excited to have you guys see what Bob and Ian have put together. All right, thank you. Okay, I guess that's uh, uh, Nate's signal to let me take it away here. Maybe uh, Ian is gonna share his screen and we're gonna walk through. We have over 70 slides of uh, pure goodness um, to kind of walk through some of these ideas. And uh, we've been kind of looking forward to this working, enjoyed working with staff here uh, in putting together these concepts and um, we're working on housing issues a lot lately, um, but this one's particularly exciting uh, given, um, you know, how big Spokane is and the extent that uh, could get used. So um, any luck there, Ian, here we go. All right. Okay, we can just go to the next one. Just gonna give you a little overview first. Um, as you know, uh, or as you talked about in December, 
uh, phase one uh, in the spring of this year, dealing with the smaller single family, uh, and the smaller missing middle housing types, including duplex, ADUs, and attached housing. And phase two um, will follow that up and require some additional changes may, that may require a comp plan amendment. And at the December 8th, which uh, we weren't there, but we worked with staff behind the scenes and helped come up with the, some of the material on that that went through uh, concepts for ADUs, duplexes, pocket residential development, attached housing and uh, lot transition standards. And next slide. Oh, uh, well, a little bit about makers, about us. Uh, Nate said a few things about us and um, one of the um, the big um, emphasis of, of our work, particularly my work, is working on implementing uh, zoning codes and design standards, because um, I was fortunate enough uh, to work under John Owen uh, when I came on to Makers over 20 years ago, who wrote some of the region's, uh, the state's first sets of design guidelines. And um, I kind of took to that early on and I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of communities east and west of the Cascades. Um, but also we've got to have a uh, heavy emphasis on uh, integrating compatible density and a lot of the missing middle housing types. And that's kind of been a part of nearly all of the projects that we've worked on. And most recently we, we were also able to work with the state on uh, two of the uh, housing guidebooks, one on the housing action plan, but also the uh, housing element guidebook. And, and we worked on um, 12 of the HP 1923 housing capacity projects and had a couple of, uh, of uh, housing projects, um, conference sessions at the last conference here. And on a personal note, before coming to Makers, I was a planner at Bonner County uh, just up the road, uh, an hour and a half. And so I used to, um, with my then fiance, now wife, uh, come, come to Spokane for a little urbanity and, and city life. And so I've had the pleasure of, uh, over the years, uh, also, um, uh, of seeing Spokane evolve. Um, but mostly my, my experiences with the corridors and, um, and downtown, of course, although I've, I've played some soccer and tennis at some fields and courts around the city as well. Next. Next slide, Ian. Okay, so uh, since that meeting, we've been working on uh, um, actively refining uh, those concepts and code provisions and testing them. And so you could see our crazy matrix at the bottom there where we uh, looked at some uh, lot examples and uh, came up with some uh, site development concepts and and uh, started testing some of the various uh, code proposals, which some of them are in the yellow slashes there, and some of our chicken scratch concepts on the far right. Next slide. Uh, and Ian's going to share some uh, project goals and concerns okay um yeah so um and my name is ian crozier um i've been makers uh, about four years and really um have um enjoyed working with bob in this kind of work um i think housing is, is such an incredibly important issue in our in, in these times um and got to work with with spokane um planning staff had a really fun time at the south university district project mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, um, we've um, these are our, our understanding of the goals that are motivating this work. Um, primarily, uh, first of all, um, to address housing affordability issues by increasing capacity for housing construction um, to address the demand side of the, of the of the of the equation, allowing and encouraging construction of smaller, more affordable units. Not all housing units are created equal. Some are just going to probably cost less. So we want to help those be constructed as well. Um, and then optimizing the regu regulatory controls for the desired outcomes and then reduce the unintended con consequences. We want our, our dimensional standards and our rules to be working towards, towards our desired ends. We also want to avoid unreasonable impacts to neighbors 
um, while allowing better use of uh, existing residential lots. Uh, that has to do with aligning dimensional standards to keep homes within a reasonable scale for neighborhoods and where possible minimizing views into neighboring backyards um, to just help protect people's privacy. Um, and finally, that we want the new homes that are added as we are um, increasing cap capacity for housing construction. We want these these homes to enhance and contribute to neighborhood character. Um, and so that it could involve, and we're proposing some minimum design standards to make um, attractive and pedestrian friendly street environments. Some of the concerns about neighborhood compatibility as we're working in lower density um, residential areas um, have to do with aggressive development practices. Um, when there's development that, that just pushes all the rules to the limit to build as big a building as possible and then uh, rents those uh, um, rents rooms in that building out um, individually. Um, and then also parking pressures um, on, on neighbor, neighborhood streets. Um, other impact unreasonable impacts have to do with out of scale homes and views in the backyards, as I mentioned. Um, and then also just um, we heard we or staff shared some examples with us of just problematic building design um, where you have blank walls facing the street or houses that are oriented um, um, away from the street or, or garages that dominate the frontage. And so we're looking at ways to address those issues. So the way we like to think about all these are, are that there are a set of proposals that that work together and achieve these goals. So there's we have a lot of tools that we use to work with. And um, so it's important to think about how they work together. And that's that's what's so great about testing them. So um, again, we'll we'll walk through these uh, these concepts and then we'll get into the uh, uh, 3D model. Uh, that actually test how these things all come together. Next slide. So the first, we've divvied this up into five or so different sections. And the, the first part here are five actions that that uh, are essentially for the RSF zones and uh, standards that deal with all housing types. And so get into minimum usable open space and, and talk about impervious area, maximum building coverage, uh, some design standards and uh, alley access. Next slide. So uh, one of them that I've been passionate about and is a big issue for, uh, for a single family in the mis and middle housing type is minimum usable open space standards. And, and so usually this is not a big deal because you've got your rear setbacks. You know, most cities have rear setbacks from 50 to 25 feet. And, and so the front loaded units or homes um, obviously meet that easily. But uh, alley loaded units, um, you know, historically, um, a lot of these lots were 125 feet wide and the, the garages were detached and you had a big uh, backyard. But you see the lower left version uh, in more modern developments, um, they're beginning to squish these things down and get smaller lots. And um, as more and more people like the garages attached to the house, you see a sets up like this in Lacey um, where they don't even have a yard um, or they sacrifice and they, they get a driveway and they, you know, you see they got their barbecue in the wood chip area next to their driveway. And they really don't have any usable open space at all. And so really you have to get more creative when you have an alley and you're trying to do small lots. And uh, so we, um, I, this project in Lacey about 15 years ago worked intensively on this issue and I've kind of refined approaches and worked on it uh, ever since with some communities that are getting new subdivisions. Next slide. So in looking at um, Spokane, um, these lots here were actually around the corner from one of the test lots that uh, Amanda gave us. And I noticed when I was looking at Google Earth, uh, when you turn the corner, it went from the little house in the left to, to uh, the four, three or four new houses there. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the image in the upper right shows that same concept. And there's literally 
this poor little back patio there uh, right on the street. And again, you got a driveway and there's, there's no usable open space. So that's for a detached house. Um, what I don't show, or actually what you can see on the bottom right image is uh, there's a bunch of single family homes um, and there's a fence back there. They're front loaded units, even though you got an alley, um, but they, they at least have backyards, but it's kind of unfortunate that you have an alley and they still have all these driveways facing the street. So next slide. So what we've come up with that we found works pretty good is um, for detached single family and duplexes have a standard that says at least 10% of your lot with no dimension less than 15 feet um, to provide for your usable open space. And largely we've said, you know, do this in your side or rear yard, but as, as we've gone forward a little bit, we've said, okay, you can do it in the front yard, but you need to delineate um, your front yard, like with a low fence to create more of a courtyard kind of a look. Otherwise, often just your grass that comes up, it makes it less of a usable and more of a visual feature. But you can see here that these are examples with an alley and at least these ones, we show a detached version, but um, even if some of them are attached, you can still move the garage over or do a single car garage, or you could do a zero lot line perhaps to um, get some usable open space. Um, for attached housing, you have some pretty good numbers already down there. You've got, um, for attached housing, uh, 250 square feet with a minimum 12 foot dimensions in the RA, RSF, and RTF. And then in the RMF, you say 200 square feet. Um, but in the RHD, you say only 48 square feet. And so I was saying, suggesting, well, maybe you at least increase that to 100 feet, 100 square feet, and maybe you stick with the seven by seven uh, minimum. And that way they could get different types of open space, whether it's rooftop, balconies, um, or a small patio. Um, so that'd be my suggestion there. And the picture on the lower right is uh, actually um, my former coworker and one of the developers down there uh, in Lacey. And we kind of looked at uh, his different lots. And this one's about 15 feet wide. And that's why we came up with that number because it felt like it was big enough to be a usable space. Whereas like 10 feet just didn't feel as usable for you know single family. And a duplex would be essentially similar except for the 10% would be for the whole lot, but then each individual yard space would need to meet the 15 foot dimension. And we think that's usable. And we'll, we also looked at that when we did our uh, lot testing. Next slide. And if people have comments, um, I know we have a lot of slides, but we assume that this would be informal. Uh, and um, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to interrupt. So the other thing, uh, initially we were thinking about um, uh, just getting rid of building coverage um, and um, with with uh, increasing the uh, usable open space standards. But that led to concerns about, um, well, right now, you know, we don't have impervious area standards and building coverage at least helps towards that end. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe in the long term, adding some impervious area standards might be the way to go. And uh, so that's something that we're, we, I think we've got a scheduled meeting um, in the next week or two to kind of look at that a little more uh, intensively. As it says, there's no impervious surface review for projects in the RSF and RTF zones. Um, and so this would just help, um, you know, examine um, each lot a little bit more for uh, impacts of uh, rainwater and infiltration. Next slide. The next one, uh, R3, I believe, gets into the building coverage. And initially, uh, since I thought we were gonna delete this and then later it looked like we were, um, it might be impractical or harder to get rid of the standard. Um, so we need to do a little bit more work here, but um, I think that we wanna do some adjustments 
strategically to relax it in some places. And that's where we, again, we need to look a little bit more. Um, you also have a floor area ratio standard, which kind of acts as a de facto uh, coverage limit um, and helps the issue. So there's a number of interlocking things and you can almost make an argument that 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 having that having this feature is excessive and it's kind of an old fashioned standard but it's something we'll want to look at a little more next slide the other thing is uh, creating some minimum design standards that would apply equally to detached single family attached single family adus and duplexes and with this, you know, we we wanted to look at the range of improvements here to come up with something that, you know, was good enough for new development without being uh, so intense that, you know, it increased costs. So we wanted to kind of promote the good, prevent the worst, and um, try to pick something. Uh, you know, we thought that maybe the example in the upper right might be about where equivalent to where you'd want to set the minimum bar and try to do something more than the, the the bottom two examples. And, you know, maybe the ADU on the upper left goes a little bit farther than, you know, that we need to, which is fine, of course. Next slide. So uh, the purpose of this obviously is to create a sa uh, safe, attractive streetscapes and a pedestrian environment, uh, getting that compatible scale, um, also uh, dealing with privacy impacts um, alongside rear yards, although some other standards get into that as well, but at the same time, still accommodating uh, a variety and roof lines and architectural styles. Um, so it, it covers a number of different elements here that we'll get into in the next slides. Keep going. So facade articulation is one and kind of looking at a lot of the you know, looked at flow, flew over town at Google Earth and, you know, you get the different as you head north, for instance, from downtown, you can kind of see the decades of construction as they go and, and uh, at least looking at things from, um, you know, 1960 um, further back, you look at articulations are kind of in the 20 to 25 foot intervals. Uh, when you get longer than that, usually there's something that breaks it up, like the brick house on the on the upper right there. Um, whereas the multifamily or duplex buildings at the bottom are kind of like 35, 40 feet each, and and they feel a little maybe a little bit long, and should be broken up a little bit more. Next slide. So again, just looking at a couple of block examples, you can kind of see the the scale, at least with roof lines and porches and, and things that typically break up the, um, the uh, homes um, and dwellings um, in the older areas. Next slide. So in our model, for example, um, we looked at maxing out the floor area ratio on a lot. And uh, that so that that one does and that home the big gable part is about 35 feet wide, but with the porch extending out is about 25 feet wide. So we, you know, probably want to be able to allow something like that. So that would kind of meet the concept that we're looking at. Next slide. Another thing is just requiring a covered entry, uh, base, really basic thing. Uh, and this would again be for all of those housing types. And so you can see, um, you know, requiring a full porch is probably a little much, um, particularly given uh, the number of examples that you have, one of them being on the right, it, you know, even just a, something three, at least three feet uh, wide, the, the three feet deep, the width of the entry is probably usually what I uh, would require. Next slide. The other one is minimum transparency. If we're talking about safe streets, where you've got eyes on the streets, you, you want a lot of windows, uh, or at least some windows. So uh, these are just a collection of images from the various uh, communities, um, actually. So we've got uh, Ellensburg, Bozeman, and Post Falls represented in these photos. Uh, 
um, with very little uh, art uh, transparency, mostly because the garages hog the, the whole frontage. Uh, but it's an issue that we've looked at in a lot of communities. And next slide uh, says basically, let's look at, um, let's would apply this to vertical surfaces uh, facing the street. And we'd probably want to, you know, work on figuring out what's what's the right percentage approach in in our in the cities we've worked at. They've ended up adopting anywhere between six percent, which I think is not enough, and that was in Ellensburg, and fifteen percent in um, in uh, Mount Vernon, which I think is probably too much. Um, but we'd want to kind of look at some of the examples and figure out, okay, is this good enough? Um, and so these are just some of the graphics. 10% was what was adopted in Carnation. It's the lower right image and shows you how much. Next slide. The other one is trying to integrate some design details. And usually for this, we would say, uh, let's put together a toolbox approach and require at least uh, two or three features. And again, this is um, the details haven't been completely ironed out here, but uh, um, a typical thing is, uh, you know, you look at window trim, and this is where you might have um, a separate standard for windows and just say, you know, either put uh, trim on windows or have a recess by about an inch or an inch and a half to, to make the windows pop out and add some depth and richness a little bit. Windows are really important on the facade. Um, but in terms of other details, you could look at integrating decorative materials and sometimes we put a minimum percentage or number on these things or types um, you might say decorative entry or porch design including decorative callings or railings and usually we have photos that say here's an example of that or maybe this here's an example that doesn't quite meet what we're going for um, you know decorative door design including transom or side lights bay windows or balconies and there's other things we can add in here, like decorative uh, um, uh, attic fan events are often nice things um, that can add detail. So next slide. So uh, these are some examples. The top ones are, for, are from Bozeman where I was working on their code. And the middle bottom one uh, example from Mulder Spokane with the bra roof brackets there and um, shingle, and porch details, balcony. Um, so just some examples. Next slide. And kind of a mix of things. So obviously the one on the right, you can't really see um, much of uh, <laughs> no details unless you call the rain spouts a detail. Um, uh, the lower left sort of has this little porch, but there's no window trim. Uh, there's pretty much no detailing unless you call it a stretch and call that porch there a detail. Um, the lower right's kind of interesting. That's from Post Falls. It was those are uh, a, a single family and a duplex, but notice the entry uh, overhang and a little bit of the window trim and at least mixing up some of the the siding material. Next slide. Um, then the other one, and this one's kind of rough because we were making some last minute um, adjustments here. It may be including some minimum landscaping and design standards. You already have some standards that apply to um, lots less than 40 feet, but this would be go a little further and maybe um, take some of those elements like the top two are those two standards right now in terms of uh, foundation plantings uh, or a, uh, the 60% rule uh, landscaping the 60% of the front yard. Um, but if you say do at least two or three items from a list, for example, some other ones are saying integrate a patio uh, with perimeter landscaping and a low wall. So if you look at the bottom image there, that's in Kindle Yards, and that's a great example. I would just stumbled on it um, on Google Earth Street View, um, and I'm going to use that else, elsewhere because you can provide these great usable spaces in the front yard 
uh, and as patios, they can work really well because they got garages in the back. Um, so this is their yard. Um, and other options are ter obviously terraced front yards uh, can be really nice with landscaping and you have a lot of natural terraces. Um, integrating simply a low fence with plantings in front or a trellis is an obvious other uh, list feature. So this is a starting point for that. Keep going. Okay, so Ian's going to take over and talk about accessory dwelling units. Can I interrupt before we jump to ADU? Thank you for that. Sure. Um, just a couple of questions on the on the design standard part. Um, I think my comments would be focused on making sure we're aligned with modern methods of construction. So some of these things of, you know, requiring you know, recesses and so forth, you know, may not be aligned with with panelized, you know, wall lines, you know, in, in manufacturing and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so you know, any ability for departures on on some of those. But then, and then the other comment would be to equally um, represent, you know, uh, defining entries. If appendages are one option, again, that's 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 challenging for for modular construction. Um, but then also saying, you know, recesses are also a good way to define entry architecturally mm -hmm. um, yes and then and then maybe just being clear that we have a departure pathway also if you're a licensed architect and to, you know so that we don't de-emphasize you know um, actual design by architects you know we have the prescriptive options but we have the yes i'm familiar with your uh spokane's got the unique departure uh, methods and uh, departures are usually a, an approach that I like to include. Um, so that's something that that we could add into there. You want to make uh, um, include some good uh, um, language in there so it's clear what types of departures are okay and maybe which ones aren't. Um, and um, and obviously you want to test them and we want to look at you know modern examples and a variety of examples and figure out is this good enough is this good enough um so that that would be my my thought there that we we'd want to look at some different types and that's something of course the planning commission if you know if you have examples um to share with staff that that would be uh really useful too yeah and then one last question that you didn't mention or show um any Code work on the privacy issue, and uh, you know, obviously, we're that's going to keep coming up. Um, how defensible is that in your experience with other cities and and you know cases where you're when you, when you're defend you're using privacy of of you know and it, where you place fenestration and so forth is it seems to me like that's a slippery slope, right? But I know it's common. Yeah, yeah, and actually, now that I'm uh, looking at this, I probably should take out that purpose statement here because we include it in a different element and not in the design standards. It's actually in the um, the ADU section and not in the standard um, housing type section. So, no, wait, actually, no, it's in no, it's actually in um, maybe staff can clarify. This 16 foot wall height, is that for all of the types or is that just the ADU, the one that we're increasing to 17? I know that's we just focused the on ADU. That's just the ADU. Okay. Yes. So later on, we have that provision where, yeah, we want to increase the, the wall height from 16 to 17 to allow more flexibility there. But then we're adding this setback plane that goes towards the middle of the lot at a 45 degree angle to sort of get at that, um, you know, to limit something from going above and beyond that. Um, so it's sort of a compromise uh, measure and you'll see in our later graphics of how we do that. And it's something that we've, you know, we're trying to add intensity and there's gonna be some windows and impacts, but 
um, we're trying to come up with a happy medium. Uh, so there may be that. more to address your question coming up, Todd. Okay, yeah. <laughs> We, we, we don't have yeah, anything in place now, though, do we, for privacy considerations of where you place windows based on neighbors' yards? Uh, I know, but we are hearing a lot of that comment um, at the counter, and we hear that at public meetings. So we're just exploring if there's opportunity to to try to address that. Yeah, like other examples of that, if if. Um... If the community felt strongly about like second story windows um, on an ADU or in the backyard, you would you could come up with some percentages. You know what what's the maximum percentage of windows that are tolerable? You could so there's there's definitely some things that you can do if if you want to go there. Um, the commissioners, do you have any opinions on this? I I've I have personal experience on this on a neighbor asking me not to put in a you know, a window in in an, in a in a loft space, an attic space, and 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 my response was politely that there's it's needed for for daylighting, for egress, for all these things, and so it, it makes me nervous in the development code that we'd be restricting your, kind of your your ability for design on 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 your own in your property rights and so forth. But it, yeah. it, it seems like a conflict there. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we should keep that, mm -hmm. keep both viewpoints under mm -hmm. consideration as we move forward. Uh, this is Greg. This it does need to be thoughtful because I've been on the other side as well, where you know a large development goes in next door that s seems to be quite intrusive. So, um, I don't know how do you how do you balance that privacy versus the right of development? So. Yeah, and the uh, the other issue is you don't have the standard for the regular single family home. So you sort of say, well, someone can build a 35 foot flat roof uh, home that goes all the way to the back and looks down on your side yard, but yet I can't put second story windows in my ADU that are way below that. So there's sort of kind of look at how all of these things come together and and say, well, what's what's reasonable here? Um, I mean, I'm facing it too. I live in Bellevue, and um, there's all a lot of teardowns in my neighborhood where they tear down the old. You know, my house is built in the '50s, and um, there's two houses across from me that are 5,000 square feet and 35 feet tall, and have third-story windows looking down in the 10 feet from the property line. Uh, it's pretty intense. And um, and in general, in, well, in particular, when, when it comes to the ADUs, which, which we'll get to, it's it's about increasing um, uh, the uh, possibility of building ADUs, and then so so there's a trade off of okay, maybe we can change where you know think about where the windows are going to be, but it's um, the goal here is is not to um, reduce buildability. It is to yeah, and think about uh, garages to. Yeah, part of it is, especially with alleys, building the second floor over garages. And so what I've heard is even the 16 foot wall height limit, it makes it a little bit harder. Uh, with 17, that allows you a little more flexibility of adding enough square footage uh, to, you know, build over a two car garage, for instance, and get a big enough uh, ADU unit. So, I, I would uh, suggest we're starting to move into the ADU. Maybe we should move to the slides unless other commissioners have questions. Um, okay. Um, yes, we got, so we have seven proposals about ADUs um, and um, including having to do with the, the, the building height and, um, and roof plane as we were just discussing. Um, First up would be increasing the allowed size for detached ADUs. Um, Spokane currently has a limit on on excuse me on the floor area for detached, but um, for detached ADUs of 600 square feet, that's pretty small compared to other cities in Washington. Um, 800 to 1,000 is pretty common these days. There has been a lot of change um, 
just in even the last five years um, in this regard. Um, so we're proposing increasing that up to 800 square feet. Um, there is, you also have on the books a 15% building coverage uh, for accessory buildings cap. Um, so that would um, prevent a very large um, footprint ADU on a smaller lot, if that's a concern. Um, that's number one. Number two would be to um, remove the minimum lot size for accessory dwelling units. Um, currently, their ADUs are not allowed on lots under 5,000 square feet. Um, that's about 5% five, 5 of the lots in, um, in, in our zones in Spokane, I think, based on, on GIS analysis. So we're not, it's, not, it's not a huge proportion, but, but there is, there's a, a fairly large number of lots that this will apply to. Um, many cities do not have a, um, a minimum lot size for ADUs because of the other ways the ADUs are controlled. It would just be quite difficult to build one on a very small lot. Um, so that is proposal number two that could open up ADUs in more places. And this, this affects um, several of the, of the test fit models that we'll be, sh be, we'll be showing later on in the presentation. Um, the third one has to do with floor area ratio. Um, you may be familiar with this term or you may not. Um, it's, but it's a, a tool to regulate overall building size without necessarily saying um, um, uh, defining tallness or, or wideness um, is just how much building. I like to think of it. For some reason, I always think of food. Uh, this, this diagram is making me think of like a slice of Tillamook cheese that you can either floor area ratio of one means you get one slice of cheese and you can fold it in half or rearrange it however you like, but that's just how much cheese you get. Uh, we have a, you have a floor area ratio of 0 0.5 in, in the RSF zone, so you get half a slice of cheese and move it around a lot as you see fit within the other standards. Um, we are proposing upping that a little bit in certain situations, up to 0 0.6 um, for lots that are under uh, 7,200 square feet and that have an ADU. Um, FAR is is a is it's a is a good standard. Um, it's um, we don't you don't usually see it. It's not super common in in single family or or low density residential zones, um, but it's it can be pretty effective. But it on the smaller end of the scale, um, when you're talking about lots um, around 4,000 square feet or so, it, you end up with not a whole lot of, of a buildable area to work with. So with a 4,300 square foot lot, you end up with only um, around 2,000, a little bit north of 2,000 square feet of building. If, you're, if you then are adding an ADU, you, um, the ADU also is included in the floor area. So you end up with, with um, with 1,500 uh, square feet or less um, that your that your house can be, um, the average house, uh, the average size for a, for a new house in the United States is about 2,400 square feet. Um, so that's a bit of a penalty, and it and it just sort of gets become more of a penalty when you're talking about smaller and smaller lots. Um, so again, here the the proposal is to provide a small boost to FAR up to 0 0.6 for those uh, lots on the smaller end of the spectrum when they add an ADU. When or if this is the um, the very exciting slide about the building setbacks and wall height, um, the current um, cap on on AD, on detached ADU height that are uh, for over a garage is um, has a 16 foot wall height and then a 23 foot peak height, um, and what staff has heard is that that. Um, and the idea actually behind this was that it was to um, require or, or to encourage builders to put in dormers because dormers look nice and, and we like them, um, but they are more expensive to build. And so this has been a barrier for construction. Um, and so what staff has heard from, heard from builders is just adding the one extra foot of wall height up to 17 feet would allow them to put a, a full window there on the side. Um, and then, and then the roof peak up to 25 feet is um, seems seems reasonable um, given that. Um, but then the other element of this is the 45 foot uh, 45 degree setback plane. So that would say just for each one foot um, that you go from the from the um, minimum side setback or rear setback, um, you, your your roof can can, can be one foot taller. Um, um, and and again, this is to to allow more capacity for ADUs in the backyard, but then also to um, 
to recognize that if you're putting a, a 25 foot roof right up against um, just five feet away from someone's backyard, they might be quite upset about that and we don't, we don't want that. Um, any questions or further discussion on, the, on this element? Ian and, and Nate, do we, we require still that the roof line matches the primary structure, is that correct? Which means that it's, then it, it has to fall between 412 and 1212? Yeah, it's supposed to, the accessory unit is supposed to match the roof of the primary dwelling currently. So we don't allow flat roofs on ADUs? Depends on the roof of the main house. Right, which is supposed to be 412 to 1212. Oh, no, um, you can have a flat roofed home in Spokane. Um, the wall height is 25 feet. So if you're, if you're a true, you know, sort of flat roof, you wouldn't have anything above 25 feet. Um, so people, you know, might want something taller, go to a different roof form. And um, Todd, we would also, part of this proposal on you see in the fourth bullet is to just increase flexibility for the roof design. And that specifically refers to not tying it to, to the, the primary house roof shape. And we have some models showing that later on. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions, I know, but, and then is 17, we're talking development code here, but in, in building code and IRC, residential code, um, I forget what the max height in the IRC is with, with the option for a loft. Is this, is this kind of aligned with that? You might no. have to uh, check that. Sure. I think it's because I, I, I kind of think it's a 10 plus seven. We just changed in the state of Washington, the state building code council. So, okay. Anyways, maybe something to follow up on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next up for ADUs is owner occupancy requirements. Um, these can have a pretty big effect on, on ADU construction and, um, and, and how easy it is um, for these to be built. Um, we're Bob and I are mostly here today to talk about dimensional standards, and this is a policy decision that that Spokane needs to um, work through. Um, so we aren't going to um, opine too much on it. But so, but two um, pr proposals for potential changes would be um, to remove the owner occupancy requirement in the RTF, RMH, and RHD zones, given that these zones are already kind of oriented towards higher density or, or rental oriented uh, construction. Seems pretty straightforward um, um, and or um, dropping the owner occupancy requirement to the first 3 years after after ADU construction. Last 1 up for ADUs um, would be to relax parking requirements um, and in particular, the proposal here is to not require parking for a um, for studio ADUs or 1 bedroom ADUs. Um, at present, you have, there's a state law that says there's no parking requirement for ADUs within a quarter mile of frequent transit. That actually covers quite a bit of the city already. Um, and Spokane has a, um, a rule that allows you to count, um, on street parking. If there's, if there's, um, on, uh, space to park in front of the building in front of the house and that can count, that can count. So you already have pretty light. Um, parking requirements anyhow for ADUs, so this would not be a huge change. Um, but again, it would help incentivize those more smaller, more affordable units potentially. Um, and with that, um, we will move on to duplexes if there's no, no more questions on ADUs. Thank you, Ian. Um, so we have a few different uh, concepts looking at duplexes and how they could uh, be uh, carefully integrated into some of these single family zones. Let's just go right to the next slide, the DUP1. So this first one is two things, both allowing and incentivizing small duplexes. So first of all, you, you um, allowing them in the RSF and the RSFC zone, um, provided each unit is no more than 1200 square feet. So um, the, the key here is that um, each unit would be counted as a half dwelling unit for the purpose of density calculations. So you see there 
um, you could have uh, five five lots and uh, four of them have single family and they're counted as one. Uh, and then you got these small duplexes, uh, they're counted as a half. Um, and uh, so there on the right are kind of uh, modeling uh, later on, you'll see our, the example of it. This is a, it's a concept that we came up with uh, recently because, uh, you know, cottage housing ordinances typically have their standards and to make cottage housing work uh, because they're small, they're a lot smaller than a regular single family home. They're more expensive to build and, you know, unless you got a density bonus, no one's going to build them because they're more expensive to build. Um, so, um, so this is similar to that and the size, so it essentially allows more units, um, but they can't be as big. Uh, so in some cases, um, the, the note at the bottom says that on some small lots, you've got the 0.5 floor area ratio standard. You know, you can end up with a much larger um, single family home. And I added some notes here on my own thing here and said, so for instance, on a, on a 4,800 square foot home with a 0.5, you could have either two 1,200 square foot duplexes or you could have a 2,400 square foot home. Um, and if you have a 6,000 square foot lot, you can get a 3,000 square foot home, but you can only get the, you know, 2,400 square feet for a duplex. So the, the duplex is going to be smaller, but then you got all, again, you got all these design standards um, that we previously talked about um, that, that try to minimize some of the impacts. And next slide. So Bob, sorry to interrupt you again, but the, no so the, we're saying that this we're, we're calling a half a unit for the purpose of density calcs, but is this also the workaround and, until we just can say you're allowed four units per parcel that we're only doing one unit in single family zoning? Kind of, yes. Um, and that's what we've done. That's essentially what most cities do for cottage housing. So. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, it's, yeah. kind of say, just, well, why can't we do it with duplexes too? Um, they're smaller, so the impact's going to be less. You know, we work on a lot of EISs for zoning codes and comp plans, and so it's our logical way of saying, well, there's going to be fewer cars. It's uh, you know, the typical size of a single-family home, a new home these days is I don't know what is it like three thousand square feet or twenty-eight hundred. It's it's five thousand, I think, in my city. Um, so, uh, 1200 is pretty small, but that's big enough to get you, you know, a, a good two bedroom, uh, unit, usually at least, um, this is really a precedence. Yeah. We have precedence for tying, uh, bonus density for public goods, such as hopefully these smaller units, maybe at a, a lower price point than some of the other housing units trying to get at that affordable housing subject because we don't have a lot built into our code that allows that. We do in mm -hmm. our D code allow for a bonus density if there is some tie back to more affordable units also. So I think that's an important consideration, 1200 square feet being a, a large two bedroom or a three bedroom unit um, and hopefully getting a, a lower price point. And, and better energy efficiency on attached housing. So mm -hmm. forth. we debated that last week at State Building Code Council. Um, and then I think the note on the bottom is, is important, right? It's, are, are you, are we exploring, you know, a 0.1 or 0.2 in bonus potentially on FAR if, if we go down this path, just like on the ADUs? Uh, no, because the 1200 cap and it's your main home, um, you, uh, you know, if you have a 4,800 square foot lot, you, um, that's your 0.5, so probably not. I see, but it's that's an option. I mean, it's that's an option allowing it bigger, but as far as whether that's going to be palatable, uh, to the community, um, is a good question. We did adopt this, it's um, in Ridgefield down near Vancouver. We, um, you know, they're growing quite a bit down there and got a lot of greenfield development. And so we adopted this, but we also adopted it for triplexes and townhomes. 
uh, with the same 1200 square foot threshold. And we also actually did it for small single family homes, uh, but we put caps there on the number that you could do. It, so if you had a big subdivision, you couldn't do this for every unit. It was like, you know, only up to a quarter of the units. So we put some protections there for density purposes. Um, next part, let's go on to the next slide. The other one is maybe adding uh, an ADU on a lot with the duplex because some some cities allow this, um, but uh, staff pointed out this this might require um, uh, be a conflict with the comp plan. It might require an, an update there, um, but nevertheless, it's an option. It's something that we modeled. You can see kind of the example there. So some to think about for probably phase two. Next slide. And then, of course, de-emphasizing um, garages. I uh, believe you already have some driveway standards for the limit of the driveway width, but uh, we would you would want to also uh, prevent garages from projecting closer to the street than the front of the house or the porch. And so, these this modeled example meets the standard. Next slide. I think we get into the next housing type here. So attached housing, uh, similar, similar things. Let's go to the next slide. So for attached housing, again, um, um, right now you have a limit of no more than two attached units in the RSF. Um, this says let's allow more provided you meet the density limits. Um, so that's the first proposal. And this is, that's just to the right, it's just an image example. Uh, the next one is doing that same uh, that same thing as a duplex, because if you have two attached uh, units, that's essentially a duplex. So let's just offer the same thing, because a, a, a duplex could be a stacked uh, one on top of each other, as well as this example, uh, side by side um, in two lots here. So um, the same half unit density calculation. Next slide. And then uh, not allowing front loaded when you have more than uh, three or more units. So, so you don't end up with the upper left image example there. Um, and you might end up with something more, you know, use your alleys or auto courts. So the lower left example is a good one from uh, Issaquah Highlands where they've got uh, integrated these little alleys and internal accesses. Uh, for you could see you could you could tell by the walkways the, their combination of duplexes and triplexes there, and then on your right are kind of the ants, examples of integrating auto courts or just a sort of the wraparound shared driveway if you don't have an alley um, or you need just an additional um, uh, auto court access. Next slide, and then you probably also want to add a few extra. Uh, uh, design standards specific to attached housing, because right now you can only do two. Uh, when you do more than two, it creates a whole other host of things that you have to address uh, that I wish Seattle could have gotten out in front of before they allowed all their six packs with those canyon overhanging uh, auto courts on the, on the upper right there. Um, so you want to usually um, you know, we have have a minimum a minimum building separation for those upper level, and you know, don't cantilever uh, over so you're within ten feet of someone else's kitchen there. Um, and then maybe even have some supporting usable open space design standards that support the dimensional standards that we previously talked about, and maybe just some basic articulation standards for the facades. Next slide. And I believe Ian's going to talk about the lot transition. Are you muted, Ian? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, the lot transition standard is is a, a bit of a complex one, and um, if there's any detailed questions, I'll probably have to ask staff to help out. Um, 
but this is another area we where we've um, identified some potential changes or even just doing doing away with potentially. Um, but right now, so if you you've got two subdivisions and one has big lots and you want to build a new subdivision, you have to make your lots that are next to the sub the old subdivision um, the same size or or um, or up to seventeen hundred square feet um, as the as the older lots. Um, so those, that would show the 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 green there. Um, this applies up to 7,200 square feet, um, and also the purple lots there. Um, uh, you have to make them the same size as the older ones if, if they're below 7,200. Um, this is the idea that this one, um, this is exi an existing standard. Um, it helps, it, or at least it's ident um, ideally uh, would address um, concerns by residents of having um, a new subdivision come in and just uh, um, a lot of a lot of backyards, um, backyards of a lot of different properties back up against their property um, is a concern that people have. Um, however, um, in talking, okay, so the first, so the first, um, first proposal is to, would be to eliminate the rule um, because um, because it, it, it um, reduces the amount of housing that can be produced. You you end up. Uh, getting more units um, if you're not trying to um, replicate the this, the size of the um, existing subdivision, um, but also this base just and uh, well based on our, our conversations with staff, it doesn't seem like it actually even accomplishes the goal of of that. Um, this is an example of of where this rule has been applied. You can see the purple lot is um, the smaller size, and then the red lot has been expanded. Um, because it's up against an older subdivision, um, and so in this case, but you can see that the red lot and the and the purple lot are the same width, and and so those those um, neighbors in the existing older subdivision are still getting the same effect of a bunch of, of of sharing a sharing a backyard fence with a bunch of properties. Um, it's just that the properties are longer than they would otherwise be. Um, so it seems like this rule may not be serving you well. Um, so one option would be to, to eliminate it. Another option would be to do a percentage standard, which would be more flexible. Um, and that would be to say 75%, um, um, you have to make the lots abutting an exa uh, established existing subdivision, 75% of the size uh, if they're larger. Um, so here you see um, the top green lots are still the same size because 7,200 is, is three quarters of 9,600, but on the lower ones, the purple lots can get down to 4,500 square feet. Um, so that way you get one additional unit rather um, compared to the existing standard. Is there any questions on that one? Hey, Ian, I'd like to just we poll the commissioners. I mean, is there anyone any commissioners that would want to go to bat to defend transitional lot sizes? And I mean that honestly. Well, this is Tim, not an Ian. I would get rid of it. Anyone else? I, I just, um, it just seems, well, to me, it seems straightforward, but I don't want to assume that everyone else shares that opinion. I also have a city that's pretty well developed. So uh, I think the whole purpose of this might have more relevance in a, where you've got lots of, you know, undeveloped land, but uh, I don't think that's the case. So that, that makes this whole thing a little less relevant for me for Spokane. Hi, this is Carol. <laughs> Carol? I'd like to, um, I'm more visual, so I'd almost like to see something in person to know, to get a better idea of how much 9,600 um, square feet is compared to 43, for example, 4350. Is there any way, um, is there any way to do that? We could come up with some sort of address examples or neighborhood examples and provide those to you. Would that be helpful, Carol? I think so. I, I would really appreciate that. Okay. Thank and, you. 
And in fact, in the next section, I think we'll be getting we'll be talking about specific lots, so that will help. Um, and the the lots that we'll be going will be going through. I'll uh, we'll be looking at four different test fit lots or, um, to look at how these new proposals would play out. Range from um, well, let's see, on the low end from three thousand square feet and up to ten thousand square feet. So you'll get a sense of some of the what what these lots feel like with some real world examples. Um, okay, thank you. Carol, I, th I think it's a really good point, and because we've talked about this before, often this is done, at, you know, from the side view of looking at a map and thinking this is a good idea, and then, or it's it's like Ian was saying, it's the existing property owners that want to defend their space somehow from from you know their neighbors, but it's never really talked about in just the experience of being on the street, right in the public right away, and so. That's always seems unfortunate that it's not about good urban design. I, I think I've said this before. I think it's an urban design problem, not a planning problem. Yeah, I think uh, if I could, um, I think you'll see in the next few slides that sort of approach of looking at different areas and different examples in Spokane and um, staff have been working on, you know, kind of recent development and showing examples that show kind of all the different ranges so um hopefully that you'll see some of that here i know we talked about kind of an auto tour uh last time where commissioners could go out on their own and, and kind of look at these examples so hopefully you'll see that reflected here bob you want to introduce this section oh okay i i thought uh i thought you were doing this the first two. Oh, okay you know? no i can do it Okay. Um, oh, great. Okay. So we, um, yes, yeah, staff, um, using their great knowledge and experience of, of, of the current planning issues and how these, these kind of rules play out, um, um, gave us four example lots to analyze, um, and to see what, what the effects of some of these changes we're proposing could be, um, late numbered 1 through 4, um, they, they're all about 120 feet deep. Um, and I've tried to keep them at the same scale on this slide as long as so, which I think is still still the case. Um, so this is these are um, this, these images are are to scale with one another, um, but they range from um, um, I believe 25 feet wide to um, 84 feet wide. So quite a quite a range in lot size, um, in fact. Um, and so um, yeah, and we've, we've created models, and you know, and we'll and we'll walk through that. Um, some of the um, here on this slide, we've got the sort of the main proposals that that we're testing out um, through this through this process. Um, we want to really see what if if you because because these rules can be so complex and they overlap in so many ways. Um, you often you make a tweak to FAR or to setbacks, and you don't know how it's going to play out until you put them all together um, and do a site planning exercise. That's the purpose of this. Um, we looked at it, a lot of stuff with, stuff with ADUs, um, the larger size, um, the FAR bonus, um, and allowing them in smaller lots. We also looked at the the smaller duplex units, um, and just how and then how duplexes would fit into RSF zones, um, and and also with the porches um, uh, uh, as and the required covered entry for all all the units. First up was lot number one. Um, in an older area of the city, um, with a again, as I said, a, uh, just a, a very narrow lot at 25 feet wide. It does have an alley, um, as you can see in the back, although it's not paved, um, which which has um, is a very important uh, thing to be aware of when you're looking at 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 this at these smaller lots and what you can fit. And this is so. This is what it would look like on the street with some of with some of these real changes proposed. Um, you can see it's a small two story house with a garage ADU in the back. It's a pretty cool car parked out front. Um, you can see <laughs> some of the other newer houses that are front loaded off to the left. That's that Bob was mentioning before. Um, um, that can be kind of disruptive, and as well as some of the more historic um, development uh, to the right here. Um, so this, 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 um, model maxes out the FAR, um, even with the bonus, you get up to 0 0.6. That's a house of 1300 square feet and, a and a almost 500 square foot ADU. So a sort of a studio ADU. That does not require its own parking space. Um, 
it would be located over the ADU would be located over the garage. You still have a good backyard in between the house and the ADU. Um, again, the ADUs are not currently allowed on, on lots this size. This is a 3,000 square foot lot, and your, your minimum lot size for ADUs is 5,000 square feet. So, um, so this is much smaller than the existing minimum. Um, but and also this takes advantage of the taller taller height limits um, that we're proposing for ADUs. Hey, Ian, I, I want to ask the question here, and for the commission, um, you know this this design it looks to me like the ADU has a different roof pitch than the primary, right? And it because it, it raises the point that the twenty five is crunching the you can move the wall height up the plate up to seventeen, but then the the ridge requirement cranks it down. And I just want to for a few of us were on here, Nate, a couple of years ago when we were dealing with the RMF revisions, and we we came up with that different concept for bringing the top plate up, and then one plane shall intercept and, and but can't obviously go over forty five degrees and so forth, right? I wonder if I wonder if that's a possibility on on ADUs to give more design flexibility, but it would it, it could mean you could violate twenty five feet. Yeah, that's sort of reflected in the proposal with that setback plane where it's a 45 degree. Um, you're being more prescriptive about what the plane is. It's 45 degrees and it, it um, can't be any can't start any higher than 17 feet. Um, and then some sort of a upper end. So uh, thinking about the impact to neighbors, you know, currently we have a 23 foot um, height of the ridge. And so is that uh, is an increase in height to uh, 25 feet. Um, is that going to be uh, something that's going to be impactful to the neighbor? Uh, and, and there's some kind of uh, ridge orientation and um, spacing considerations that I think um, up to the side lot lines that you'll see that um, uh, that might uh, uh, kind of offset that increase in height and uh, the impact to the neighbor. Thank you. I guess uh, chiming in on that issue, maybe one thing, if you had an interest in providing more flexibility on that, you could say, um, have the height limit be 25 or uh, allow taller if it matches the uh, roof line of the primary house or something like that, caveat it. Um, that could be one way of doing it and adding more flexibility beyond 25 but still complying with all the other standards. So that, that could be an option. I wanted to bring everybody's attention to this illustration too. It, sh it, it shows really well this um, extra uh, allowing the porch into the front setback mm -hmm. of six feet, um, which is something that we don't allow right now. And in, in, so the 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 porch we're yeah we want to provide an incentive so people are to do the porch and not have it be a not punish builders for it, including that building six feet come from it's a standard that we've been using for over 20 years um you know most codes and i think yours allows two and a half or three feet just for the eaves and all those normal things um but six feet i think um it came from, um, you know, uh, porch widths, although you really you like to have an even wider porch width. Some some cities allow eight foot extensions, but um, it depends on what your initial setback might be coming from. But six foot's kind of a feels like a, a good compromise, but you, I wouldn't go any less, but, you know, you can go farther, I guess. If yeah, you think that's, that's better. It seems like kind of a new urbanist thing is, is there some guidance, you know, that makes a good point? <laughs> yeah, well, you think about, uh, you know, wide enough space to allow some chairs and walking in front of it. Um, you know, I think six feet allows for a little bit of that and eight feet's a bit more comfortable, might, might be able to put a table in there. Um, Interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. 
Um, uh, moving on to lot number two. Um, this is um, a 40 by 120 square foot lot. I believe this is in Brown's edition. If I'm not mistaken. Um, it also has an alley. Um, uh, obviously a much leafier kind of neighborhood. This is what would fit with the new rules. This is a, a detached house with, again, it's kind of the same thing as the last, a detached house with an ADU over the garage. You could also in this building envelope with the small unit duplex uh, uh, density bonus, so this could be a stacked duplex of 2,000 um, square foot units. Um, something along those lines. Um, here's the stats. It's a. Uh, can, can I interrupt for just a sec? Could you go back, yes, please? Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Brown's edition has a historic overlay, and anything that in that historic overlay would be, you would have to do a design review. So um, when we're looking at, and this is our only local um, neighborhood with a historic overlay, Cliff Cannon is second in line to. Do one, so I think we we're, we need to be cognizant of that. That we can't just pick a, a neighborhood and say we can do that here because yeah. Correction here, this is this is on eleventh, so it's near Brown's edition, but it is okay. Yeah. So My apologies. Okay, it's not within that. Good, <laughs> thanks. That's what I get for um, making an assumption about a city I don't know. That is a good reminder that we do have that district, though. Thank you. But, but that is going to be our, our challenge, right? Because that we're trying to do a citywide effort here and then mm -hmm. it's just going to exclude those neighborhoods from. From some of these typologies that to make them competitive, I think we don't want to do cookie cutter anything. So I think that's part of how you get people to buy in is make sure that you tailor whatever you're going to do to the neighborhood so that it 1 size does not fit all. So I'm just going to. Yeah, and, and absolutely, I hear you on that. Um, I think my tendency is to say we need to accommodate modern methods of construction in, in these designs too, and they're just going to be a conflict if you put a historic overlay on it. We're not going to get to that those infill typologies of you know um, of, of modular. It's all going to be well. You know, Brown's edition is already there. It's pretty darn dense, so I think there are various ways to get what what mm -hmm. we're after. Yeah, these zoning standards we're discussing are in the RSF and some in the RTF zone. Brown's edition, for example, is zoned residential high density. So these, all the discussion today won't apply in Brown's edition. And with the historic overlay, that adds another whole element that we're not tackling with this. So that's good clarification. Yeah. I apologize once again for mentioning Brown's edition. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, Ian. Um <laughs> Okay, so we've got um, basically similar stuff as the last one. You um, with the FAR of uh, with the bonus at at, at zero point six, you're able to get a pretty much a full size house, uh, twenty one hundred square feet, as well as a uh, full size ADU. If if you were to if if, if Spokane were to go up to the eight hundred square foot ADU, um, and takes takes advantage of um, all those other changes listed on the on the last one. Yeah, we that's a two car garage there. Uh, oh, good that ADU above it and partly a side of it. And, um, it, and which, uh, because of, again, it's a larger ADU, maybe it's a two bedroom ADU. So, um, you might still have to provide a parking space for it. Or, alt or for the house. <laughs> um, here's what it looks like, uh, more or less. On 11th. Probably keep going. So I'll talk about lots uh, three and four. So this one's uh, a bit bigger and a bit uh, more uh, newer compared to the other ones. Um, uh, so 8,520 square feet in the RSF zone. Front loaded, no alley access. It's not got a slight bend there um, in a lot. It's got the garage in the front. Um, let's go to the next slide. Shows what you could do with some of our changes. And this shows a detached house and a accessory dwelling unit. Uh, but on this view, you just see the bigger house. 
And um, since this house is larger than, or the lots larger than 7,200, we're still using the uh, 0.5 uh, FAR, but you can see how we put the garage in the back and actually remove the rest of the house with the, um, the porch. In this case, it would be quite a bit closer to the street than some of the other, um, at least the fronts of the other houses. Next slide. So here's here's how it looks, uh, and you can see the site layout there. Um, that we've actually squeezed in a uh, driveway because of the lot, uh, squeezed in a driveway that leads to the back of the ADU there, and a one car garage, and the ADU is both on the side and above the garage. So um, this incorporates that increase in ADU size from six to eight hundred and the increase of wall height and the peak up to 25. Uh, the porch projection, and you end up with a 3,400 square foot house and a almost 700 square foot ADU. So you're still not maxing out the ADU there. Um, and your FAR is just under 0.5. Next slide. It shows the aerial and how it, how it fits in. So, um, so this is about my lots about this big, and um, you know it's it, it's the homes were originally mostly single story, but it shows you that you know there is some room, uh, even though you don't have alleys. There's oftentimes some room to integrate um, the, the structures in the backyard. Next slide. So this shows a uh, uh, the small lot duplexes. Two 1,200 square foot duplex or duplex units, uh, and an accessory dwelling unit. So we've added. Um, uh, you can see the driveway there, and that's how it would look from the street. So from a scale perspective, it's kind of uh, in the roof lines. It's kind of right in there. It's just that there are two units. And so um, next slide, we'll show you the site plan layout in the garage. And so this is the one where. Um, with the duplex and ADU might need a comp plan change, um, but you can see actually the way the lot fans out, it works pretty good at fitting that uh, both a good size backyard still and a two car garage um, and the ADU. So this integrates allowing the duplexes and the RSF uh, with the density bonus, counting them as half units, uh, the ADU. Um, and all those other things. So you end up with uh, two 1,200 square foot ADU or um, duplexes. And the ADU actually is only uh, just under 500 square feet uh, because you're still stuck with the 0.5 floor area ratio because a lot's over that 7,200 square foot threshold. Um, any comments on this before I move on? Could you clarify what the comp plan conflict is? Is I, can, I can address that. Uh, the policy, I think it's H in the housing chapter 1.20. It just talks about uh, ADUs being accessory to a single family residence. Oh. So, and and one ADU. So we're we're just um, we thought this was interesting to model and to think about. So we wanted yeah. you to see it, but but um, it may be in the future more than some of the other changes. So it's not about number of units and um, because you're, you, it's the same as a, an ADU with a single family because now because you're, you're going half, half plus ADU. Yeah. Right. ADU That's why Bob wanted you to, to think about this, but. Um, but yeah, we also want to make sure we're staying within policy right now, mm -hmm. but maybe we want to change policy, so. Yeah, because some cities even allow ADUs with townhomes, um, for instance. Yeah. Next slide, Ian. So uh, let's see. Hi. Here's... Hello, I have a question. Sure. Who, something who just this? occurred. Something just occurred to me. Let me turn my phone up. I'm sorry, I turned it down. I think it's Carol uh, Shook. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, this is Carol. Um, um, for the 
owner occupied um, dwelling, the owner needs to remain with the at this time with the uh, ADU. When it's a duplex, how does that? What's the rule there? It, does the owner does the the owner own all three um, properties and has uh, to live in one of them? Well, I guess we have we haven't thought that far ahead as as far as what what will happen with the owner occupancy, but this is showing a single lot with three different units, but they're all under one ownership. There's not a subdivision of property in this example that we're showing. Does that clarify it? Oh, yes, that's what I thought, but I just was wondering about if the owner needed to remain in one of the uh, rentals or one of the duplexes. Okay, so that'll be a question down the road. Yes, but I, one, I like that's a, it is good. It's a good one because you couldn't do this with a two unit attached house with a lot split. So a fee simple. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving ahead here. Thanks, Ian, for I noticed that our slide, we had a slide that was out of order, but um, Ian just fixed it on the spot. Um, so this shows uh, how that looks from overhead with the, uh, you can see there that the, the setbacks are slightly closer, but that would, um, at least with the porch extensions, but other than that, the scale seems to fit right in. Um, a change, of course, allowing the, um, or at least in this scenario, having the, the structures in the back, although you could build the garage in the back right now. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the last lot is uh, over 10,000 square feet, uh, 10,080 square feet to be specific. It's a perfect rectangle, uh, so pretty simple from that standpoint. Next slide. And this shows a uh, detached house with an accessory dwelling unit, which you can't see from this image. It's kind of to the right of the tree in the back, um, but it's a bigger, bigger house taking advantage of the 0.5 FAR um, with a garage there. Next slide. And here you can see the layout. Now you can see the accessory dwelling unit. Um, so this shows, um, a 4,000 square foot house in this case, and maxes out the, uh, ADU at 800 square feet, um, and a 0.5 FAR. And, um, I believe, so regarding parking, note that we, we show the two car garage and we don't show an additional parking space, um, here. And check me if I'm wrong, staff, but if you, if the ADU is only one bedroom and doesn't have two bedrooms, um, you can use the um, on-street parking space in front of the house to accommodate the one, the plus one parking, correct? Yes, as long as you have 20 feet of frontage. Yes, and this would meet that. So that's why we didn't show uh, an additional driveway and garage in, in this case. But that's uh, adding up all the the numbers to get to the 0.5 and you end up with this. Uh, and let's go to the next slide, should show the aerial. There you go. So that's um, showing it with the aerial. And again, it's, um, you know, it looks like it's a little bit more um, floor area than most of the other ones, but it's within the current standard. Next slide. The next one adds, uh, shows the duplexes again, and at the 1200 square feet. So these is actually ends up being smaller and less square footage uh, than the previous one. So the, um, you could see that the, the one on the right, the unit there is both the, um, the space above the garage there, plus the, or the gabled roof articulated part in the, to the left of it. Next slide. Now here you can see the 
how it looks, the site plan extruded. Um, so actually, Ian, did we, um, so in this one, we didn't reduce the square footage, did we? So this one's actually shows more. Yes. Yeah, this is a, this is a, would be a full size du duplex if, if such a thing were allowed on the site. Um, but yeah. it, because the lot is larger than, um, it still meets the density of, um, of, of, uh, um, 10 units per acre because, um, because it's such a large lot. Okay. You're right. You're right there. So that's kind of the difference. Um, so these units together are 4,500 square feet. Um, and so they would be, uh, half of that size, basically, um, if the lot were smaller than 10,000, I believe, um, you, you couldn't do this. Um, so that gets to point point four six. You can see there. Uh, next slide. And now this shows the, the aerial view and how it fits in. And again, the, the most notable thing there, aside from being a duplex, is showing the, the porch extensions out in the front. Next slide. So we're almost done here. I think we just got a, a couple more slides. But the other thing we did want to talk about the roof set up because um, it's uh, one common thing we're seeing more shed roofs all over the place and even in Spokane I understand you're because it's a simple efficient cost effective uh, roof form and some people just simply like it um, we wanted to show an example of how that would fit so one complication is how it fits with the um, uh, with our setback plane and the wall height set up in fact the um with the wall height the current standard is um i guess we talked there could be some interpretation issues um with it but in our case um uh let's go to the next example kind of explains a little bit um so this shows it a little bit more closer in the upper left i show our uh, the wall plane height is 17 uh, at the setback, and then it does the 45 degree setback plane. So, you know, in this case, you notice that we've set back, we've uh, oriented uh, the shed roof over to the side of the property. So the smaller uh, roof part is uh, closer to the property line. That allows us to meet the setback plane as well on both sides. So if the lot were narrower, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to meet that unless the whole roof got lower. You know what I mean? And then the next example, the next page is a different type of shed roof, and it's uh, you know a little bit lower, so that would more easily more easily make it meet it. Uh, but this is where kind of proposing. There you go. This is kind of illustrating how you know you don't we don't think you need to match the roof type, especially if most of the time you can't see these from the street. And particularly if you have a, um, you know, you might want a modern design or maybe you've got a suburban um, style 80s house, 70s house, and you want something a little more hip in the back, uh, you know, just because maybe you don't like the main house and you just want to make it look better uh, and have a different roof line. So I think a, a, a clarifying question. Does okay. the current code require the ADU roof line to match the main structure on the property? I thought that's what I heard earlier. Yeah, the, the, the text in the code from the accessory dwelling use or six accessory dwelling unit section is the roof pitch must be the same as the predominant roof pitch of the house attached house or manufactured home. So we would need to modify that with this proposal to allow the different pitch or different type of roof. Okay, just want to clarify. Thanks. So that's um, so that's what we have. Um, that's what we have for now. So a lot of uh, quite a quite a bit of material there that we're working on. Wanted to to 
keep it at a higher level, at least for this. Um, there's more details to be added and specific code language, but that's those are the concepts so far. It's a great presentation. Um, in your experience and work with other cities, are you seeing increase incentive structures with FAR? And if so, then do they do they does that allow them to start to dump, you know, lot coverage and things like that? Or what's the right balance there? In terms of allowing more FAR or we're using that as incentives. So I mean, we, we didn't talk anything about cor corner lots and alley lots today and so forth and having an incentive FAR density bonuses, you know, like Ellensburg, Ellensburg takes a density bonus and mm -hmm. priority, but. Um, it if... kind of depends, uh, you know, every community is a little different. It depends on your starting point, how you measure density. Um, there's just so many different uh, versions of this. Um, so, uh, you know, I tried to get Bellevue to look at use FAR as a tool, but they didn't go there, for instance. Um, uh, but Seattle, actually, we're going to be working on uh, the city of Seattle's uh, EIS uh, for their comprehensive plan. And as part of that, we're going to be looking at, at some potential zone changes for the single family zone. So we're going to be right in the thick of it. Um, and modeling. So we're going to do some of these similar models um, in bigger neighborhood models as part of that project. And so they're going to be looking at some things that go farther. And, you know, they've already, they already allow some of these backyard cottages. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And there was just a, uh, a letter to the editor from the Seattle Times in the paper this morning, not to change single family zoning so it's it's going to be a battle um but um you know i know other cities kirkland is looking has uh has done some interesting things to allow flexibility in lot sizes in some of the zones provided you integrate low impact development um so they're they're yeah they're doing some interesting interesting things um yeah i'm glad to hear you with Working with Seattle because yeah, Rick Moeller is the chair of the planning commission in Seattle and a professor at UW and really he's a strong advocate for FAR bonuses based on context. Mm -hmm. and, he, and when he says context, he means very specifically like this neighborhood, this you know, Wallingford okay. should yeah. be explored at, at the neighborhood level and give these types of FAR bonuses, whereas maybe it's not appropriate in Finney Ridge or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm sure I'll hear some of that. And so it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the bigger city, of course, it gets more complicated the more you the more you do that in neighborhood by neighborhood, uh, in on especially with the zoning. So there's a you know there's a balance. A question about the uh, three year requirement for the owner occupancy on the ADU. Um, I think. In some circumstances, that might make a lot of sense, but I wanted to kind of get your take on the pros and cons of how fast things might be adopted if we didn't have that three year owner requirement, which means people with uh, rental properties, for example, would be building ADUs at a faster rate. I think that it would really make a big difference if you did not have any kind of restriction on the ownership occupancy. And the State Association of Realtors has also taken that approach. You have some impact um, to um, because yeah, it is just it's just harder for established properties um, just because of the paperwork and the and the enforcement and the and some probably it probably would make it financing. But one big impact is you wouldn't have it um, any ADUs constructed. I would I would assume as part of an as new development, uh, you know, in conjunction with the house. Could I chime in on this because? We're also working on uh, short term rentals. And so we have to look at that as part of the equation as well. Um, when we have, you know, 3000 plus short term rentals in our community, that's taking away housing that we could be using. So if, if we're not going to put some real 
um, strong guide, guide rails around where short term rentals can go and um, make the make those rules a little bit more stringent. We're going to have a situation where people will be building ADUs, uh, renting them out as short term rentals and the main house is short term rentals as well. So it's really not going to unless unless we fix that problem first. We're going to not really see the result that we want to see. That's that's what my um, and that's what we're working on right now. Somebody in planning, I can't remember who, but we're working on short term rentals. We are. Does that need to be coupled though with the effort of just building more housing? I mean, it's it could be just a independent effort, right? Are you talking about independent effort on short term rentals? Well, I, I guess in the context of what we're doing here today is our goal is to, you know, it's is to is to bring these into and an encourage development, right? Which yes, doesn't have to, be, have to be have to be delayed yeah. until the but question if you're doing of ownership. Just yeah. to you'll be doing it for naught. What you'll have what will happen is those will be taken over, and you won't really get the results you want. Is what I'm saying. So. I think that that's got to be part of the conversation. It, yeah. We can't ignore that. But would we change any, would we make any different decisions as a commission based on that consideration? Well, you won't know until we've done some research and come up with some, some things for you to look at. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, some communities have have um, uh, not allowed for ADUs to have short term rentals. Um, so that might be a conflict in Spokane if we already have operating short term rentals in ADUs. Um, I don't know how many that would impact, but um, this the current proposal on short term rentals is really um, focused on regulation in other zones other than residential where they're already allowed. So there's sort of separate issues in terms of um, you know, right now you could have a, a short term rental and an ADU. Um, so if we're, if we're um, making it easier to build ADUs, um, you know, that that still, uh, that still would be, yeah, I guess there, there may be a few more of them, but it's not going to be, um, it's, you know, not necessarily going to be a big impact in terms of the short term rental market. Yeah. It and it's an honest question. Where is that policy consideration impacting dimensional standards and things we've talked about today? And maybe there is. I just I... so Nate, I think you and you're working on something different than Council President and I are working on, um, and Jesse Banks is helping us as well on the short term rental situation. So we not we're. I don't think we're in the same place as you are in terms of what we're working on. So just saying, and, and at some point we're going to have to all come together and decide that we're going in the same, same direction. What are the next steps? Uh, great presentation today. And so I'm just kind of wondering what, um, for yeah. Terrell and staff, where, where are we going from here? Yeah. We're going to continue to be working now that we're, we're getting closer to really working on the code writing and providing you with some code drafts. Um, I think that they may be a month out here. It, it does take us quite a while to go through all the interlocking parts of the code and come up with the draft. Um, but I think we've heard, so I've been trying to take good notes and I'm sure we'll listen to this again and and hear where um, there's some alignment and where there were some concerns and, and come back with code that starts to address those. Um, but we hope the modeling helped you really think about um, the changes and illustrated some of the complicated topics like floor area ratio and, and what it looks like. Um, related to ADUs, is there a way we can have a workshop or presentation on the building types we're seeing across, you know, different cities, these ADUs. Um, I think that's probably an area where, you know, especially as we get into 
the actual construction type, you know, the, the idea, the concepts of 17 feet and so forth, you know, we're some case studies of, of those. You'd, you'd like to talk with the building official? No, at more architectural, like this is, this is what we're seeing, you know, in ADUs in Portland because, and, and, you know, in California and so forth, because we're seeing a lot of, I know I've talked a lot about modular and prefab today, but a lot of these are going prefab and that's, that's something mm -hmm. that, it makes them pencil out, right? But are we accommodating them in these, you know, ideas? Yeah, we actually, um, we keep a, a kind of a matrix of all the different cities um, ADU standards and we have to update it all the time because uh, everybody's constantly changing them lately because it's been such a big issue. Um, so we've, you know, bring in Montana examples because we do some work in Montana and Idaho and and uh, obviously looking at some of the Oregon examples. Uh, but that's um, we could. I think we've shared some of that with staff, and we can, and that um, we can make some of that available at least soon here, so you can at least compare yeah. or see examples of what other cities are doing in terms of. Um, square footages, um, owner occupancy, um, parking, and all those types of standards. Are, are you trying? Are you interested, Todd, in in construction manners that make them more affordable because they can be quite expensive? People are often shocked how much it costs to build an ADU. Is that is that what your interest is? Or yeah, especially especially when we get into building types and, and forms and things like that, you know, are, are they accommodating a lot of the, you know, some of the, some of the cities are doing pre-approved designs and obviously mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot in California, we're seeing a lot of offsite, you know, backyard modules, things like that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's more of my curiosity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we any more of, is the city of any of these? Sorry, what was that, Todd? Are we going down a path of pre-approving any of these infill types in the city of ADUs or potentially even duplexes, maybe? I, I don't Yeah, there's discussion of, at least for ADUs in the housing action plan, for um, some suggestions to proceed down that route. Um, that would be a separate effort from these code changes. But... Mm -hmm. Um, something to consider. Yeah, and once we have our code changes in place, that certainly any architect or builder could say, hey, I've got these plans that meet the city Spokane standards. So I think that's what's also happened in a lot of communities. I'm just curious, the most recent city uh, newsletter that came out talked about the elements of uh, what uh, Nathan and Amanda and uh, the consultants here have been working on, but it, it also talked about some um, uh, a kind of quote from somebody about wouldn't duplexes throughout the city be a great idea. And uh, so I was wondering who who chose to put that quote in that uh, city newsletter? Was that uh, the mayor and her staff or was that the planning department? I think that was our communications uh, staff. Okay. It seemed like someone was sowing a seed there. So I was just wanting to know who was behind that. Yeah, I think I think that that quote was chosen to sort of generate interest um, and show that there's um, you know, sort of an opinion on, on both sides. I think in the in the one quote, we were seeing elements of um, uh, both, you know, something for uh, all parties to uh, identify with and generating interest because, uh, as, as you mentioned, we had a, uh, a an open house yesterday and we have we're scheduled event uh, for tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, virtually and so there's still time to register for that and uh, hopeful we're hoping to you know help generate interest with some of the content we're hearing and to share that back with you it's lewis so dropped the mic good, on his way out the door did he we had, we had a good turnout for the uh first one as well so so are these uh Side's going to be available so we can take a look at them more. No, 
No, Lewis? Not this time, no. You can't make that decision, Lewis. You're out the door. <laughs> yeah. Not this yeah. time? Oh yeah, we've been posting um, all the presentations and video on the project web page, and you can actually go to shapingspokane.com or shapingspokanehousing.com now, and uh, you'll be redirected to the project page. And the, uh, we've also posted the video, or we'll shortly post the video of the open house. So, you should uh, see that. And Commissioner Francis participated, I should have mentioned. Yeah, I think that was my quote. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't my court. I'm not the one that said it. So, okay. Well, good work, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Anything else? Yeah, we hope it was helpful. And and if yeah. you have any more questions or feedback, please email us. No, it's just great to see how fast this is going. So, yeah, yeah. I, I I will say I really appreciate it. I it put a whole lot of meat on the bones. So I appreciate that. That was great. So, and we, you have a new planner there, right, Bob? She an intern? <laughs> yeah, she's uh, working her way up. <laughs> she learns fast. Yep. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good, Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.